So we welcome everyone for the last session of the day. The Vishya today has been India's knowledge systems content, society and quality. And we have with us Sri Raghava Krishnaji, who is the Dean Academics for Rashtram School of Public Leadership. And he would be speaking on Desha, Rashtra, and Nation. Sri Raghava Krishnaji is the co founder and associate dean academics at Rashtram School of Public Leadership. And he carries with him 17 years of corporate experience with expertise in leading cross-functional creative product development teams. In his last role as the development director at Electronic Arts EA Sports, he led the operations for the EA's mobile game development studio in Hyderabad, engaged in crafting highly defined digital consumer experiences for global markets with a PNL of 50 million and a player base in excess of 3M DAUs. I don't think I understand that very well, but I would leave it to him to explain what it means. <laughs> After his corporate stint, he moved into public policy to engage directly with India's governance needs. He is a student of Indian civilizational thought and is currently pursuing his doctorate from Chinmaya Vishwa Vidyapit. He is also the founder of Trikarana, Learning and Development Solutions Private Limited, where he trains corporates and universities on creative product development skills, such as design thinking, design making, mental models, and leading creative teams. Raghavaji is also the co-founder of the Rashtram School of Public Leadership, which is organizing and hosting this program. So all accolades to him for holding this FTP, giving us all the vision. And over to you, Raghavaji, on Desha, Kala, and Nishan. Thank you, uh, Richaji. Uh, typically, introductions are the most uncomfortable part for me uh, in any of these conversations. And I think we should also find a good indic way of, uh, <coughs> of just uh, making them simpler. <laughs> right, uh, uh, it's a privilege uh, and uh, it is with great uh, respect and honor that I uh, come to share with you uh, my thoughts on the subject of uh, uh, today, which is Indian knowledge systems, the perspectives on uh, society and polity. Uh, uh, but before I get into this, uh, I just wanted to uh, take a step back and uh, uh, just try and explain from our perspective, from the people who've uh, tried to organize this uh, uh, IKS FTP, what has been our vision, uh, what do we envisage? such? And, and since I would also be uh, present uh, in a couple of workshops that we would have uh, towards the back end of this program, uh, I think it's a good opportunity for me to set that context right now and build that vision in our minds collectively. Uh, there are, of course, any number of FDPs that happen uh, in universities, and uh, you know uh, this is part of an academic life. Uh, but the uh, the vision that animates the FDP that all of you are taking part in today uh, is is not just about uh, an academic requirement, uh, but we think of this as a civilizational movement. Uh, it, it's also the uh, impulse that guides, and uh, you know, in fact. Uh, it is the reason for uh, all of us at Rastrum to be together, uh, which is to generate self-aware and civilizationally assured public leadership for India. And I'm sure uh, over the course of last one week or so, as we've delved into the thought models, the ideas, the spiritual uh, vision uh, of our knowledge systems, uh, it must have uh, surely stuck us uh, quite a few times about how uh, in most of our cases, I'm sure uh, some of you are uh, acquainted with these knowledge systems and definitely more knowledgeable than us. Uh, but in most, uh, uh, in the lives of most ordinary Indians, uh, we do not, uh, by design and by intention and by policy, 
uh, for some reason, do not get into touch or get into contact with our own knowledge systems in a structured way. We call ourselves a civilization. Uh, the constitution opens with the words Bharat, that is India. Uh, but we really don't have a conception of what Bharat is. Uh, sometimes we get an idea of a political conception. Sometimes we think of this as uh, an agglomeration of different uh, communities. Uh, sometimes we just think of this as a landmass. Uh, but how did this all come together? How did this, you know, this piece of land, uh, the number of communities, the diversity that we have, uh, the complexity that we have to engage in on a daily basis, how is it all coming together? And uh, you know, unless we come into contact with the knowledge systems, uh, you know, for in most of our cases, we are sort of groping around for answers and for vision, and lifetimes are spent. You know, uh, there might be any number of Indians today who've gone through an entire lifetime without ever having an opportunity to look at our own vision, our own inheritance, and our own uh, uh, way of looking at the world. That is, uh, uh, that is all right, uh, you know, if you're engaged uh, uh, in your own personal pursuit to a certain degree, because life has its own pulls and pressures. But it is, it is, a, it is an inheritance of loss if you haven't managed to actually recover that contact. And that is really the role of teachers. Uh, that is the uh, whole vision that drives us at Rastrum and the reason for this FDP. It is not just another training program for us to also have you know, just a contact and uh, uh, engage in our intellectual personal pursuit. Uh, but we think of this as a bit of a movement uh, to try and correct what we see as a huge vacuum and as a huge gap in the current design of the education system. Uh, and, and you would notice this in the way we frame the FDP itself when we said, uh, you know, the idea of this FDP is to talk about the imperative of Indic knowledge systems. Now, what is this imperative? Like, where does this conviction come from? Or what is the truth claim here, if you're calling it an imperative? And, and that, to decode that, obviously, we've looked at uh, certain concepts of our fundamental uh, spiritual ideas. We've looked at uh, traditions. We've looked at how the high philosophy and daily culture in terms of Deshya and Margya meet together. We've looked at this landscape, uh, but there is one key component uh, that has to actually uh, play a huge role if this vision has to manifest. If all of us have this collective vision that our education should represent our knowledge systems and all of us should become in a part, uh, you know, in a way, uh, or instrument uh, towards that vision, uh, it has to then also reside as a policy. And that is also the essential link that national, uh, the new educational policy gives us, uh, that it like, at least talks about the Indian knowledge systems uh, to a certain degree. Uh, and it gives us the opportunity to then have this dialogue, to think about what does this vision mean from the educational policy perspective? And how do we come together as teachers and people working in this idea uh, to make this happen? Uh, but by itself, uh, just the mention of IKS in NEP is not going to be enough. It needs obviously a lot of uh, work on our side to first uh, you know, become aware of these knowledge systems, cogitate on the relevance of these knowledge systems in the context of the global challenges that we face today. And then also think about what is the instrument that we have as a public policy concern or in terms of our own state design uh, that we can leverage to advance this goal that we have. So there is a sequential uh, in a certain degree, but there is also a leap of faith process in this, that we look at the darshana of our own knowledge systems, we internalize that conviction, we become the sort of ambassadors for that, and then we understand the different elements that will help us galvanize support for this vision. And that is how uh, at least the people who've been thinking about this FDP uh, and the prayojana of this FDP uh, have conceived it, that we all should come together in the context of de redesigning our own education system to give our next generations an organic, uh, authentic, immersive contact with our own knowledge systems. And it is in that spirit that I talk to you today about the need also to understand, examine, scrutinize the idea of quality itself. And uh, it's very important. I'm sure some of you are uh, you know, keenly plugged into the political debates. Uh, some of you might have seen it in the context of how that directs social discourse. And in a lot of ways, we are also consumers of whatever is being produced elsewhere in the world, 
because it is beamed into the palms of our hands and into our families. Education has to uh, really provide a vision for all of these, right? Uh, from the way we conduct our discourse in our families, to the way we interact with other parts of our society, to the way we think about our nation, and what does uh, all of us together as a nation represent for the world, and what do we have to offer? Uh, so the subject today is uh, Desha, Nation, and Rashtra. Uh, and while most of our conversations so far have been about looking at the world from an inward to outward perspective, Right? which is we've gone inward to look at our own knowledge systems, to look at our own vocabulary, to rediscover our own traditions and uh, clarify in our own minds the uh, validity of the claims that we're making as a civilization. I'm sure that's a reflexive process and that will continue. Uh, but I would like to take a slightly different approach today as I approach uh, this, this discussion uh, for the next hour and a half uh, to try and uh, uh, understand how the world has looked at certain theories what is the world that we inhabit today, which is a function of certain historical, political, cultural, economic, geostrategic uh, moves, and uh, locate the idea of Bharatiya Jnana Parampara, and particularly in the context of our own state design, uh, against that. So I would, for the initial part of my presentation, try and present a view of what are the theories of state, what does uh, you know, what does this idea of nation mean in the way we receive this understanding today, uh, you know, whether it is political philosophy or sociology or uh, any kind of uh, research on issues like nationalism, all of them have a certain kind of paradigm and a certain kind of thought models that inform uh, the very ideas that are given to us by, uh, let's say, by our institutions. But uh, our approach today is to actually look at that uh, and examine it by being centered in the Bharatiya Drishti. So we'll go through a tour of what are the stories that the world is telling itself, uh, particularly in the political realm, in the idea of state design. And then we would uh, do a Purva Paksha of that from our perspective and see how is the Bharatiya Drishti on state and state design and the idea of Rashtra different and uh, does it have a different emotional quotient? Does it have a different moral content? Uh, we will try and examine those questions. So I will hope to finish uh, you know, the presentation that I have in about an hour. Uh, uh, Richaji or Namrata, if you could help me, uh, just keeping time. Uh, I want to leave some time towards the end for a cogitation and question and answers. Uh, but keeping in this mind, uh, keeping in mind the spirit uh, that uh, there is, uh, of course, there is a seeking to understand this, but there is also a commitment to. Uh, try and uh, try and see how it can be informing our own academic disciplines. Right. That let me just share the screen. And so, when we talk about collective individuals and state, uh, you know, there are bigger questions uh, uh, that uh, education and particularly teachers have to engage with in the context of nations and governments, society, economy, and in all of this macro. How is the micro of an individual fitting in? This is also what we call a civilization, that there is a coherence, there is a kind of mutual, mutually reinforcing positive feedback loop between the individual, the collective, the nation, and the nation's interaction with the rest of the world. And we call ourselves a civilization because we managed to do that over a significant amount of time with the highest degree of sophistication. We call ourselves a civilization because this land has managed to produce ideas and those ideas have informed the daily lives of people and pursuing those ideas and ideals, people have found happiness and they found meaning and joy in the very existence of uh, association between their lives and the land. This is really the context when we think about a macro uh, setup like Desa, Nation and Rastra. And uh, the first sort of idea and, and personally uh, uh, a line that uh, shook my own uh, indifference uh, uh, to actually thinking about the larger issues uh, comes to us uh, from Mahabharata. It's a loose translation. Uh, it's, it's like a, a capturing the essence kind of statement that the sum total of all knowledge is governance. Uh, of course, in, in our vocabulary, we call this loka samgraha or welfare or well-being of everyone. But this is a central concept. You know, there is an accusation that comes to us uh, from the left and particularly from the colonial lens uh, that 
there hasn't been a political philosophy or a political unit called india or bharat that we lack the thinking around state and nothing can be farther from truth text after text tradition after tradition thinker after thinker will tell you that there is a very very uh, deep and an established school of thinking and a way of thinking about governance itself and i think this uh, you know i would invite everyone to reflect on this because all of us are in the field of uh, acquiring disseminating and representing knowledge uh, but all of that knowledge also has to yield uh, in a certain kind of well being for people and the medium between our knowledge and the well being of people is what we call governance and the governance happens through multiple institutions what we call state and nation and all of those ideas which we'll come to uh, but at a very fundamental level the drishti or the aim of knowledge uh, even in the indian context right from the ancient times has always been sarva mukti it the liberation of course is an individual pursuit Uh, that is a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition. The ask from all liberated people has always been to work and strive for the liberation of all, and it is in the liberation of all that our own liberation exists, and that happens through the instrumentality of governance. So, if we look at that, we also try and now understand what is the alchemy of a worldview, because that's what we're trying to do. We're not. I'm not looking at uh, you know. Uh, is going into certain definitions of what is a nation and state and and be with it but how can we develop a culture of thinking around this uh, you know typically what is called a world view or an anchor that provides us the the mental and uh, emotional stability to look at all the ideas that come to us being anchored in a certain point of view and then examine the content of those ideas from that point of view and that is what we call a personal world view and of course uh, teachers of psychology in this group uh, would be able to tell us that uh, fundamentally all of our actions come from these meanings that we give to ourselves uh, you know and and that is the constitution of our world view if i think about and this is coming from uh, uh, david frolyge's work uh, god sages and kings uh, it's inspired by that we can think about the stories of the world in a few uh, categories Uh, you know the dominant category today uh, particularly in in the, in the context of what we hear around uh, covid that there is a scientific idea of universe right uh, and and if you are a student or a purveyor of this thought uh, you know you would think about the story of the world as a series of discoveries uh, made by science which has changed obviously uh, the very way uh, we interact in fact we are interacting uh, today through a digital medium and a technology that science has given us but broadly there is a string that attaches or that uh, brings together the whole development of science to where we are today the one element uh, that seems to be a new entrant particularly if you look at science as science is understood today or as scientific is understood today as a as a gift from the western civilization to the rest of the world uh, the one dimension that we see missing when we approach it from our perspective and which is also being increasingly recognized by scientists uh, around the world and there is of course there's a lot of uh, important uh, work happening uh, within the western hemisphere about consciousness itself right but that is one addition that we see and if you are a believer in this you will have certain heroes you know all of us congregate around our uh, fellow uh, world view holders and uh, you know it's like a bonfire we all sit together and uh, we have a conversation the conversation would uh, inevitably take us to certain heroes or certain movements or certain key events in history right the discovery of wheel telescope newton uh, as a figure einstein as a figure then there is also the idea uh, of the human history or human evolution as a mercantile idea right it's the story of business and technology not just the science behind it but how science has been uh, uh, given to us as a consumable and how uh, finance as the backdrop for all history in the way it has facilitated trade and business a lot of people in the world today hold this world view and when we uh, interact or when we try and talk about a uh, indic knowledge systems based world view or a bhartiya gnana parampara you also have to engage with people who look at the world in a very very different way uh, from how you would probably see it and in that context uh, we'll have to understand and locate people where they come from what are the fundamental axioms and uh, this is a dominant axiom today that civilization is a story of business and technology 
and history and everything has been shaped by finance and uh, discovery of tools and uh, methodologies. And, and there is a lot of truth in this. Uh, clearly, uh, uh, a movement like discovery of gunpowder altered the uh, entire history of nations and civilizations. Uh, a, a printing press, as we, as we would see later, is actually uh, considered to be one of the reasons why we have the political structures that we have today of a nation state. That the whole idea of a nation state comes from the discovery of printing press because it made it possible for people to share literature in a certain format. And of course, wheel and maps, uh, you know, one of the most fundamental discoveries that uh, sitting today here, uh, we probably don't trace it, but uh, you know, there was an intense competition between the colonial powers, particularly the Dutch and the British powers, to discover the, uh, the route to India. And whoever was able to master the uh, uh, art or the science of map making uh, had the strategic advantage. And, and that is how we've landed to be where we are today. Right. So there is a lot of truth in this, and, and uh, uh, there are people who look at the story. There are others who look at the story of the world as an evolution of uh, a certain kind of uh, political uh, contest, if you will. Right? Civilization as the constant struggle for power. Uh, this is coming to us from the Marxist theory and, and you know, people who look at uh, events like revolutions uh, as the key movements in history. Uh, and, and, and that is a uh, hugely influential worldview as well, because power is a real thing. Uh, all societies uh, uh, exhibit uh, a fundamental characteristic of uh, power dynamics. Uh, there is, of course, also the truth uh, to a certain degree about uh, how power uh, then seeks to oppress uh, some people who do not have power. Now, the challenge, of course, is to, uh, uh, is to engage with people and say that that is one dynamic, uh, perhaps not the only dynamic. Uh, but for somebody who's seeped in that thought, it is very natural that they would look at the world uh, from that perspective. And so certain key movements would be French Revolution, Marxism, rights of man, democracy, etc. So at this point, I, uh, I invite everyone to reflect what is our worldview? What is our story of the world? Uh, from, the, uh, from the sessions that we've had so far, from obviously the rich experience that all of, uh, all of you carry, uh, how do we think about forming or, or establishing solidarity around a Bharatiya worldview. And I'll come to this question uh, at the end, end of my presentation again. Do we agree with these ideas completely or is there a different idea of evolution that we have? Uh, and if so, what purpose and what moral service can it provide to the world today? That is, I, to me, an important question. Another way of looking at this uh, is, you know, we've gone from hunter, grower, borer, warrior craftsman to you know finally being a startup founder currently uh, that's the highest in our evolution that all of us uh, find or, or establish startups and and uh, you know that's really the pinnacle of uh, human uh, civilization and this is also important I, 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 uh, I do not want to belittle this uh, all of these have shaped uh, our very experience today uh, but uh, the reason I'm presenting to you in this format is to uh, try and uh, Kindle us thinking around the story that we need to carry with ourselves. Right? So if we examine this a little further, there are certain key perspectives uh, uh, and you might have seen, particularly those, uh, those of us who are active in a public discourse uh, or uh, engage in conversations with our students, uh, the world that they inhabit, our learners inhabit, is now governed by a lot of information that they get around all of these ideas. Even as we sit in a classroom and we are talking to our learners, their mind is today engaged in all of this discourse relentlessly, incessantly, because it is a highly networked world and we all receive our information from multiple different sources and sometimes do not have the, uh, uh, the, this, the power of discrimination or the viveka uh, to also think about the sources and the content and the intent of that information that we get. But this is, uh, this is our reality, that there are certain binaries given to us. That there is something called an objective versus subjective. There has been a split be between the mind and matter, at least uh, uh, in, in one civilization. And the, uh, the loss of the magic mind, as anthropologists call it, our ability to experience wonder, our, experience, our ability to experience awe, our ability to just look at nature and, and be consumed by it, all of those have uh, you know, undergone a fundamental change. 
how did a culture that spoke about virtue ethics uh, going back to the greek civilization end up uh, developing the atom bomb and this has uh, disillusioned uh, an entire generation of young people whose moral imagination was captured by by the moment and by the experience of war and post war trauma right and and that led to a, a massive change in psychology a lot of uh, conflict that we see today arose because uh, you know the uh, the aftermath of uh, world war 2 uh, really disillusioned people from the promise of science and democracy and every other story that they've been told and there is nothing more dangerous than harming the moral imagination of a young person because the young person has his or her uh, entire life ahead of uh, him or her uh, and then it does not have any map no meaning now imagine an entire civilization going through that that kind of uh, uh, experience uh, there's also been wonderful uh, uh, discoveries in science that have constantly uh, upgraded our own understanding from newton's uh, you know mechanistic view of the world to the quantum theory of world to the theory of relativity uh, science has also been uh, a fundamental driver uh, and and a brilliant uh, champion for critical thinking and being open to knowledge Uh, there is the history project there is enlightenment uh, uh, when we talk particularly in the context of nation state in the context of political economy in the context of institutions and leadership a lot of our wisdom today what we take as granted unless you go through what we are going through to you know in, as part of this faculty development program to rediscover and reframe our ideas is really the ideas that come to us from this uh, you know from this continent uh, in 17th and 18th century and all the historical events that have happened uh, in in the western uh, hemisphere uh, at that time which has led to certain universalization of values and there is today a lot of uh, uh, reflection coming from bharat around whether or not these values actually capture our own truth and that is part of my uh, 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 effort today uh, to try and uh, examine what the content of those ideas is uh, particularly in the context of state and nation and then uh, do a poor reflection yeah so ultimately all of this has led us to a certain recipe of liberal democracy uh, in contemporary parlance we call this the killer app democracy is the biggest app in the world because the western civilization has then given themselves the mandate to go and install this app everywhere in the world uh, and and that is what some people some uh, uh, political scientists have called end of history it doesn't mean that history ends it means that the quest or the need for history writing has ended because we've reached the pinnacle of human evolution in a combination of free markets democracy and uh, institutional arrangements of political parties it just took 20 years for that entire idea to unravel and today the the very purveyors people who were absolutely certain about the validity of this idea for all times to come who then took upon themselves the job of training the rest of the world uh, to on how to be democratic are going through an intense moment of catharsis where they are not able to identify their own ideas in their own uh, uh, in their own civilizations right so uh, it also tells us something fundamental about uh, about uh, the human condition that certitude uh, and therefore uh, you know by extension the impulse to universalize is actually a big risk it is one of the things that really leads to conflict as they say the road to heaven is laid down through the paths of uh, or, or good intentions it is not just good intentions but it is also the right knowledge which again going back to our civilization is very very clear the emphasis on the right knowledge and the right perception cleansing the faculties that we have antakarana and bahya karana that is the adhikara that we get to have an opinion about certain thing in our culture in our civilization uh, and therefore the civilization actually places a extremely important uh, uh, or emphasis on sadhana on the ability to actually embody what you think you represent because it is only then that you get the adhikara to speak right that is a totally different way of thinking about uh, uh, the relationship between our psychology and the institutions that we create uh, versus the idea of end of history uh, so that's a fundamental contrast as we examine this uh, when i think about uh, how do we cultivate this kind of thinking before we get into you know maybe some definitions 
uh, what are the, uh, let's say the academic disciplines, even if they're not fully formed, what are the areas of study that as uh, teachers uh, and as, you know, as enablers of uh, people, uh, young people who are going to deal with this multi-dimensional complex world, there are a few uh, dimensions that uh, I felt we should all become familiar with. Uh, the idea of uh, political science, what we are sort of discussing today, uh, how that translates into public policy, how states uh, you know, create actions, the uh, foundation of psychology in all of this, uh, probably the most critical discipline going forward because we are all connected in an unprecedented manner and information is getting exchanged and ideas are getting formed. Uh, at a rate uh, that does not really correspond with our own evolutionary mechanisms. Uh, so therefore, there is a massive uh, uh, need uh, for all of us, particularly uh, for the world, to understand Vedic uh, and uh, Bharatiya psychology. Uh, of course, philosophy as a meaning-making process, uh, uh, you know, even uh, fundamental inquiry into of, uh, our relationship with nature, our relationship with ourselves, and in the Bharatiya Drishti, the, uh, the idea of oneness. Uh, similarly, economics, science and tech, institutionalism, uh, sociology and anthropology. Uh, I just wanted to just, just give a quick taxonomy of certain concepts or ideas uh, that we would have to engage with if you're looking at uh, uh, you know, influencing, uh, particularly in the policy space, but also I would, uh, I would hasten to add that even as fundamental as education, now becomes multidisciplined and uh, it is at the intersection of all of these disciplines that we will have to think about our classrooms. So if it is, uh, uh, you know, if it is uh, intersection of all of those, uh, it's clearly complex. Uh, what makes it complex? How do we understand uh, the complexity? Uh, firstly, the very idea of a state is not an organic idea. It is an idea that we've given ourselves through some historical experience, through some theorizing, and then sort of becoming the, uh, uh, the evangelist for that idea. Right? And, and so there is, it is not a natural institution in, in many ways. Uh, and therefore, there has to be a tremendous amount of cognitive engagement and psychological comfort developed uh, to understand and really internalize this idea of state and what happens. And why is that? Uh, it's because the, uh, unlike, unlike our actions, uh, for example, uh, as a teacher, our action perhaps influences the class that we teach. Uh, as a uh, member of a, a, a society, uh, let's say in your apartment complex, it, it influences the actions of your neighbors. But as the state, any action by the state impacts everyone. State cannot be a scalpel. State is always a club. So if there is a decision uh, you know, from the uh, Union Government of India, as a public policy to impose something as a policy or to bring something as a policy. It's very difficult for any of us to argue that we would want to be, we would want to exempt ourselves from the policy. It does not happen, right? There is no opt out. We are all by default opted into public policy, right? And therefore the complexity as well. But really the, uh, the, the locus of this complexity is that there is a tremendous amount of diversity of actors and not only is the cast and crew extremely diverse, their motivations and their definition of success and failure is entirely different. In a classroom, there is a natural coherence between what is the uh, goal of the teacher and what is the goal of the learner. It is to learn, understand, and uh, you know, hopefully advance towards mastering a certain subject and making it applicable and useful for the society. But think about a problem like Kashmir or think about uh, or any other, uh, no, most recently the uh, problem that we had uh, of farmer strikes on the farm bills. Clearly, what has been touted as, uh, as a policy which is great and which has been agreed upon as great by many people has also not been agreed upon by many others. They did not share the definition of that success. And that is the multiplicity of criteria. There is literature around this in political philosophy for those who are interested. This whole idea of wicked problems by Rittel, R-I-T-T-E-L, and the framing of wicked problems in public policy is an entire exposition on this, that you have different actors and each set of actors has their own criteria and definition of success. 
So synthesizing, bringing all of this obviously requires public leadership. That is also the idea for us to develop that kind of complexity thinking. Uh, but fundamentally, it's also respecting the, the whole context around public policy. To understand this further, where do we locate this complexity? What is the source of this complexity? We can think about the society as uh, you know as four sort of perches, right? Four positions, vantage points, and think about what is the operating logic for each of those uh, perches. If you think about politics in, in a modern context, the need for people to represent us, politics by default operates with the logic of legitimacy. The concern for politics or a politician is to be seen as doing the right thing, is to be seen by people that he or she is a valid representative. And imagine we have to really empathize with the politicians. It's easy to say politics is bad and politics is rotten. And there is, of course, a lot of truth to that. But it is not easy. It is the most complex and competitive field there is. At least in a, in a, in a democracy, your politicians, your representatives are the people who have to come back to you every five years. You do not have that access to any other institution, whether it is the courts or the police or the bureaucracy or any other organ of the state. You do not have any direct say in their appointment or in their performance. It is actually the practicing politician who at least has to come back to you and seek your agency once again. Imagine trying to do that when you, know, when you have such a diverse, complex sort of society and each of them has their own definition of success. So it's not an easy job at all. And it is understandable, therefore, that their primary concern will always be about how will people perceive my action? Will they see this as being in their interest or will they see this as being in my interest? It's a fundamental issue. And therefore, to avoid such scrutiny, there is a lot of obfuscation that is created. There is a lot of institutional capture that happens. And the whole idea of engaging with this kind of uh, uh, method is because unless the macro environment of nation is facilitative, uh, a lot of things that we do as teachers or as citizens do not find their best optimum result, simply because the environment does not allow that. Uh, it's something that we've recognized in our own journey in the last six, seven years uh, about how to think about training people on public policy. Now you contrast that with markets. On one hand, there is a concern in one part of the society, a critical part of the society. This is coming, by the way, from a book called The Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism uh, by Daniel Bell, a very influential book. And he talks about uh, these four being the uh, autonomous realms with their own logic. If politics has is fundamentally concerned about representation and therefore seeks to maximize how many other people I can influence is good, markets seek efficiency. Markets is about input versus output. What is the best way in which I can get an output from a certain input? So therefore, there is a natural tension between these two. One is trying to expand. The other is trying to become efficient. And markets tries to influence politics. Politics influences markets. So there is a lot of struggle and tension between these two. And uh, a culture, a civilization has to find a way of reconciling this. Similarly, you have on the other two axes, you have society right, as, as, uh, as people, as communities. And there are certain ideas, certain values that animate a society. We could argue that today the dominant idea is equality. It's an idea that I invite all of us to really examine critically. Equality of what? Equality where? Equality of opportunity, equality of outcomes, equity. There's a whole lot of thinking around this. But fundamentally, there are certain ideas that society as a collective anchors on. And then you have individual or individual culture as culture as an artistic expression of an individual. They are concerned at an individual level about self-expression. I want to express myself. And this is a dominant impulse in the culture today, particularly because we are a highly globalized, interconnected uh, society where we are drawing the imagery and uh, we're drawing upon the uh, seductions that the world has to offer relentlessly. And therefore, it is natural that we will have desires to engage in that and, and to express that. A lot of that really is great because it leads to new art forms, new kinds of engagement. A lot of it is also anger that all the things that are being shown 
I do not have access to. And therefore, there is a constant sense of uh, depression. It goes back again, uh, you know, this whole culture that we're seeing of loneliness, anxiety, and depression. The fundamental need for uh, Bharatiya Drishti in psychology, in, in helping people understand that life can be divine. And this instrument is not just a means for experiencing uh, desires, although that is fundamentally a part of our uh, Purushartha, it is also a means for transformation. So this is the challenge. This is why it is complex. And this is why it is important to understand uh, uh, you know, the context of state, nation, and government. I want to take a quick pause and see if there are any questions at this time before I get into definitions. Uh, maybe uh, five minutes, five, seven minutes, one, two questions. Uh, Namrata, if that's OK. Yeah, surely, Raghavi, I can just uh, request if participants have any questions, we can. We can put it in chat or we can uh, even raise our hands if we have any questions. I want to just get a sense of whether uh, you know we are looking at it the same way and, and we are able to identify with this because this is not uh, uh, just, just uh, you know, one idea. We are trying to bring multiple ideas together. I think the participants will need to be allowed to uh, unmute themselves, Shrihan. Or they could ask the questions also. If you could unmute and ask the questions midway, even that is fine. Okay. I get a, a, a message from Dr. Sheetal uh, uh, Tank that disciplines and perspectives needs to be revisited. Uh, surely, uh, what I'm proposing is just my idea. Uh, but if you, uh, we don't have the time to get into a full discussion on that today. But I think as part of workshop, this is exactly what we have in mind that how do we understand the fundamental thoughts and concepts uh, in Bhartiya Drishti and how do we take that back? What are the main applications of that potentially in our own disciplines? And to do that, we'll also obviously have to examine what are the ideas in those disciplines today. That is the uh, intent of that uh, slide, uh, uh, Sheetalji. So I, I hope that part is clear. But uh, the workshop that we have, I think, uh, uh, first week of December is uh, entirely uh, around this. Yes, on the third and the fourth. Yeah. Any other questions? You could please raise your hand or unmute yourself. Or we could take the questions later if you are not right. able Dr. to. Dr. Uh, Mansi Chaudhary uh, uh, mentions that this fundamental should reach everyone, even at the basic level. Uh, absolutely agree. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, you, you've given us our uh, mandate, uh, Dr. Chaudhary. Uh, it is uh, exactly the idea that we have at Rastrum that there has to be uh, a recognition of this. Uh, in fact, we are uh, planning to introduce an undergrad program. Uh, Dr. Richa Chopraji is, in fact, leading the curriculum building efforts for that, which we hope to announce next year uh, as part of our uh, university's intake. But uh, it's not just about one uh, institution or one this one. This is something that has to really spread out to multiple uh, uh, universities and uh, be a part of our uh, uh, education uh, from an undergrad level. Totally agree with you. I see one uh, hand raised. Uh, please go ahead, uh, uh, Kyle Willie. You can unmute. Uh, unmute yourself. Unmute now, sir. Oh, well, once again. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, we have a diverse culture. And mm -hmm. how do we go from micro to macroism? Uh, won't we have a lot of hindrance in it? And how do we face these challenges? Sure, uh, we, we have a, challenge, a lot of challenges even today, whether we uh, you know, want to go from micro to macro or uh, you know, just, just be in status quo. There are a lot of challenges. And I think the first uh, uh, step is to recognize that these challenges exist. Right? Uh, and build our own awareness and build our own perspectives. My, uh, my entire... Uh, uh, appeal is that we cultivate certain habits of mind uh, to first engage in this because these debates are no longer out there. These debates are right in our families. They are right now happening uh, all around us. And therefore, uh, it is very, very critical that we have some kind of apparatus to make sense of this. Uh, uh, so the way to do it is firstly, understand our own ideas. 
the way that we've tried to do in the last one week and we'll continue to do. For example, the idea of Srishti Stiti Laya based on Purusharthas. We have to first understand that, okay, that is a concept of dealing with change. That is a concept of dealing with creativity that is there in the world today. Do we first create things and then hope they fit in, which seems to be the dominant impulse today? Or do we look at the world and understand what the world needs, which is the Purushatha way of looking at the world and create what is needed for stability? So this dialogue between the teachers and the learners, between parents and their kids, between members of society is a critical component. Uh, so that to our, uh, you know, at least to my mind, that is the way we go from micro to micro by first understanding uh, and making sense of this uh, for ourselves that there is this complex uh, dynamic around us and therefore we need to upgrade our own thought models and we need to examine the world in multiple perspectives. Yes. Thank you. Thanks a lot for enlightening us with this oh, idea. No, no, no enlightenment. <laughs> there is uh, a question on the chat by Ranjana ji. Not a question. She suggests, please focus on yes, growth absolutely. and innocent text. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, uh, Dr. Chopra, Richa Chopra ji is actually going to do that for us. Uh, she is uh, embarked on a PhD to think about a Sukha index and told. Uh, so we've, uh, we put that in the very, very competent hands of uh, Richa ji. But yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's a central point. Uh, and I will come to that towards the end of my presentation today. That politics is really a means of well-being. Right? And, and it has to be located there. The fundamental pursuit is well-being for everyone. And because we've identified our, ourselves excessively with politics, we are not able to think about the purpose of politics itself. What is supposed to be a means has become an end, right? And that is really the Bhartiya critique of politics today. And we'll come to that. I totally agree with you. Okay, so uh, if there are no uh, questions at this time, I want to just go ahead and delve into the definitions of state, nation, and government as they come to us uh, in political philosophy today. So what is a state? Uh, you know, in a normal class, I would invite a lot of dialogue and opinion and uh, we would all build this together. But given I have only one hour, I don't have the opportunity to uh, do my uh, classroom style uh, teaching. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is, there is a tremendous body of literature and knowledge and theories uh, about uh, state. Uh, of course, our theory of state is Rashtra and I'll come to that. Uh, but if you look at the, uh, you know, the city-state civilization in Greek uh, Roman culture, that's polis, right? Uh, uh, you know, the idea of uh, Plato's uh, uh, Republic uh, has been there. In Italian context, uh, there's the idea of Stato and Civita. So different civilizations have called it differently. Uh, but, you know, a couple of useful definitions that come to us, which help us understand the fundamental characteristics or the fundamental constitution of this thing called state. State is as a community of persons permanently occupying a definitive territory or a definite territory, legally independent of external control, which means sovereignty. Nobody else is ruling over us. It is the Indian government which is taking decisions and possessing an organized government which creates and administrates law over all persons and groups within its jurisdiction is state. I will condense this in the next slide, but for now, just look at the key words here. And one very, very popular uh, definition, and it's a definition that we, we you know, uh, it can actually be transformative once you start thinking about it, uh, you know, especially in the context of uh, some of the uh, strife that we see around us when people come to streets, right? Uh, who, who is in control? So state is a human community that successfully claims the monopoly over violence or monopoly over legitimate use of physical force within a territory. They understand uh, uh, you know, this, where is it coming from? That in a natural setup, if you do not have one authority, it means that there can be multiple contestations and there can be forever uh, you know, the act of the power or whoever is in power oppressing the people who do not have power or the groups that do not have power. This is also, the Indian thought also recognizes this. We call this Matsya Nyaya. Uh, and this is a condition that uh, uh, that is absolutely adharmic. And therefore, a lot of Indian thinking in Niti Shastra, Dharma Shastras, uh, and particularly in Arthashastra as statecraft, uh, 
uh, is all about the legitimate use of statecraft to avoid Matsinyaya. Right? So state is definitely the entity that has the monopoly over legitimate use of force. That is why when there is a police person standing in the street holding a gun or a lati, we accept that. But if somebody else does that, we do not. Right? That, is, that is the difference in our own uh, uh, understanding. So if we distill this, there are four conditions that make up a state. There is a definitive population that identifies itself as a population. They just don't identify themselves as nomads. Right? They, they are there as settlers, as people who are from the land. There is a definite idea for territory. There is actually a, a finite boundary uh, to what we call ours as a country. Right? There is sovereignty, which means that we are not at the mercy of somebody else. We have found a means to elect our own institutions, or we've agreed to be governed by institutions that we feel represent us. That is sovereignty. And lastly, there is an organized way to make decisions for the collective, which we call government. If you were to distill it further, it boils down to two things, that there is the idea of power, that some entity has power and we recognize that power, but it is not power by brute mandate. It is power that is recognized as legitimate by the rest of us. So there is legitimacy to that power. This is an important condition for a state. This is also what uh, this is coming to us from the political philosophy that we have from the West. Right? There are different approaches to how the state was formed. How did this whole thing called state come into being? There is a story of force theory that you know you had different tribes, and at some point, some tribe or some family or some uh, jati managed to uh, because there was also. Uh, once we discovered agriculture, we could actually be in one's place and uh, we could protect our cattle and there was no need to keep moving. Okay? And therefore, there was a requirement for somebody to be in control because you're not just moving and you're not just plucking things from the trees anymore. You are cultivating land and therefore you're producing something and that product has to be stored and used and distributed. And therefore, there was an organic emergence of one entity in it could be one tribe or one family or one person uh, which managed to subdue others and claim power that is theory much of the western history uh, 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 you know comes to us from this idea of divine rights uh, because there was always in the western uh, historical experience uh, from the time of christianity a contest uh, between church and the aristocrats or or the nobility versus aristocrats about who is the legitimate owner or legitimate representative of people. Uh, this whole idea that we keep hearing about church and state comes from that history, that in different parts of history, over different courses, at certain times, church had gained ascendancy and it sought to co-opt people and control the aristocracy. And certain other times, aristocracy gained ascendancy and it sought to control church and people to establish its law. This is also why, if you think about history, why do we see new coins being uh, issued, new currency being issued? Every king comes and issues a new currency. Because the king is trying to establish his or her authority at that time. He or she is saying, I do not recognize the past authority. From now on, I am the sovereign. And therefore, this is the currency which bears my name or my image. Right? But church will fight back and uh, you know, it will convince people that there is a bigger kingdom and a bigger uh, authority uh, than the, you know, what we have. And the king has legitimacy because the king or queen has legitimacy because they are ordained. There is a divine right that is bestowed by king through the medium of, uh, by the God, through the medium of the church on the king or queen. And therefore, it is the church that has the power and control as the representative of God, right? So this is the idea that there is a divine rights theory and it, all people should follow that person who's appointed or anointed as a king by the church because there is a kingdom of heaven and the church as a medium has managed to represent that. And therefore, you know, whoever the church ordains as queen, king or queen has power. The most prominent theory that comes to us, which informs a lot of our contemporary institutions, is the social contract theory, 
Uh, I'll quickly go into the social contract theory because it is the most important uh, experience that we have today. Three main thinkers who've uh, looked at uh, the social contract theory. As the name implies, uh, the idea that this theory espouses is that uh, all of us as individuals have uh, certain freedoms, but we forego a few of our freedoms uh, and hand those freedoms over to one entity called state because there are certain things that we cannot do as individuals, which we want the entity, the collective entity called the state to do for us. For example, protecting our boundaries or building highways or managing waterways, taking care of our stormwater drainage in, in a modern sense. These are things that can only be done as a collective because it involves huge amounts of collaboration between disparate sets of people or a huge amount of land. right? So the collaboration problems and the ability to actually work together means that we'll have to sacrifice certain freedoms and, and we come together. But, but, but also, also reflect on the theory there that it's a contract, right? And, and it is through that contract that we also get that language of rights. Right? All kinds of rights today uh, are come from this idea that we have foregone certain freedoms. This is an enlightenment idea. This is an idea that is coming from that historical experience because they had a very different contest for power there between church and the aristocracy. Hobbes examined the question of how was the state formed and what was the need for the state. In a very, very influential work called Leviathan, he asked what is the state of nature? What is the default setup that we have? And he said, in a na state of nature, everything is brutish, nasty, and short. Everyone, bellum omnium, which is everyone, contra omnis, which means is fighting everyone else. So the state of nature in Hobbes's vision was very, very stark, very dark. And he said, therefore, you need the stronghold of one entity called state, which can order the entire society. So he had a vision of an absolutist state. Is why it's called the Leviathan that you need that entity, otherwise uh, there is anarchy. Locke is the next uh, uh, important thinker in this, in a book called The Second Treatise of Government, Peace and Ease. He examined the same question of what is the state of nature from where we derive this idea of uh, state itself. And there uh, uh, he said it was not always nasty, short and brutish. He had a slightly more uh, benevolent or a more benign idea of the uh, state of nature said we were okay, uh, but once we started uh, becoming a society that has to uh, store uh, and therefore you need to have a certain idea of what is yours, uh, whether it is in land, cattle or what you produce, the question of property rights became paramount and to protect that property rights, you needed some central authority right? and that authority was the first state. And then this got consolidated uh, further uh, in the works of Rousseau. And he, in fact, uh, you know, had a book on uh, social contract, it's going to be on the principles of social contract. His view of nature was even more, uh, you know, he said, the original state of nature was beautiful. Right? Uh, Locke considered the advent or the idea of uh, property rights as our fall from grace. Uh, Rousseau agreed with it, but he had a slightly more benevolent idea that it was actually uh, a spiritual experience initially, uh, idyllic happiness. Uh, but again, he also agreed that uh, state had to be formed because we fell from that idyllic happiness. We can we can sort of uh, you know sense the echoes of uh, biblical uh, mythology here, right? Uh, the fall from grace, the original sin kind of thinking uh, in this, and therefore you need some kind of authority to uh, go over that. Right? So uh, that is the theory of the state, uh, briefly the social contract that. In uh, you know the first state either came because uh, there had to be some absolute authority, or it had come uh, because uh, property rights had to be protected, or because you know we we were not able to collaborate and work together, having fallen from grace uh, in that idea. And there are uh, you know once the state theory is formed, uh, there are vision uh, statements about what is uh, what is a good state. A uh, uh, lot of thinkers uh, from Plato to Hegel uh, think about idealist theory. They have certain ideals uh, or, or certain purpose, a certain kind of what is, uh, you know, in, uh, in political philosophy called teleology or an end state for, this, uh, for the role of the state itself. Okay. 
Marxists have a very different idea of state. They look at state as a coercive instrument, that state imposes violence. Uh, uh, and because there are different classes fighting for each other, the state is captured by the elite and they use state to oppress. And therefore, revolution is needed for the people who are getting oppressed to overthrow the ruling class and become the state themselves. That is their uh, theory. Uh, and then there is the liberal theory, which is broadly the most uh, pervasive theory that all of us also are experiencing today, that the state is there as part of social contract. State has few functions. It should not get into everything. So religion should be separate. State should be separate. State should concern itself with a few things like security, uh, like taxes, like providing public goods. There is a whole theory uh, around what should be the role of the state. right? So that is really the idea of this thing called state uh, uh, in the Western world. Uh, and we have also uh, uh, largely at this point, that is our imagination and definition of state as well. If that is state, what is a nation? We all hear words like nationalism. We hear like India is nation. Uh, you know, sometimes you need to look at your uh, uh, your literatures or, or writers, not the political scientists, but actually people who write fiction to tell us the truth. Uh, Terry Pratchett uh, says that one person is nothing, two people are a nation. What does this mean? So we spoke about four characteristics of state. And we are going to look at four characteristics of nation right now. A nation is not a hard institution like state. It does not state. The minute we imagine state, we are able to imagine the parliament building. We are able to imagine the ports. We see the imagery of you know a convoy going out. Uh, you see each of the state building today. There is power exuding from every single image that the state has. But nation is something far more uh, uh, emotional. It is uh, uh, the content of nation is, is very different from the content of state. It anchors on a story that we tell ourselves. When we say Bharat or when we say uh, uh, India, wherever you go in India, you see, you see similarity in certain ideas, right? And you all, we're all together as Indians. When you look at the uh, national flag, when you look at certain things, it evokes a similar emotion in our hearts. It's because we have an idea of a common history. We also have an idea of shared culture and territory. We also have a sense of who is an Indian and who is not, not just in terms of uh, uh, you know, being in the country, but even if an Indian goes from India to some other country, yeah, as long as the heroes and the symbols and the myths that we carry in our minds are from our civilization, they become uh, the markers for exclusivity. Right? It's not just about the past, but there is also a vision for future. So nation building, when we talk about, it is all these aspects that you talk about history, you talk about your culture, you talk about your boundaries and geography. You must have heard from Pankaj uh, 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 about the Tirtayatras, the Kshetras. You talk about your own exclusivity, who we are and why we are different. So this is the identity formation process. There are fundamentally three concerns that every polity or every civilization or every nation has. Identity, the question of who we are, Stability, the question of how we come together, and prosperity, how do we create conditions to have a good life? Right? So nation is about answering these fundamental questions. So if state was about uh, power and legitimacy, nation is about identity or the question of why or who we are, which is appended or which is sort of first answered, which then becomes the uh, uh, you know, basis for seeking a state and seeking certain boundaries for ourselves. So it's a question of identity plus power plus uh, most important uh, observation perhaps, but uh, definitely most popular uh, uh, comes to us from a political philosopher called Benedict Anderson. And uh, he says nations are imagined communities. Right? And, and there is of course, a lot of uh, truth in that. And he also says that it was made possible because of the invention of printing press. Because once printing press started uh, being functional, literature was printed and it created a mass medium like the internet and social media of today, like how we use WhatsApp to get a lot of information. Printing press obviously was the first one which made such mass dispersion possible. And that also meant that one idea could translate or, or should, should sort of pervade a certain territory. And you could also understand the natural boundaries based on your own language and ethnicity. And this is critical. 
when we start examining this from Bhatiya Drishti, uh, language and ethnicity was the basis for nation formation in the European experience. And that is what they have imbibed. So when they look at us, they look at Bharat as how they look at Europe. That's how they've formulated this. Europe had these multiple languages where French uh, you know, language was used. That is the French territory where German was used. That is the German territory. And these are two separate nation states because language and ethnicity became markers for creating nation states. And the idea of a nation state itself uh, consolidated after a prolonged war of 30 years. And that war itself had a religious nature to it. Uh, and, and the treaty that uh, ended the war is called the Westphalian Treaty. You might have heard of this word. Uh, but it was basically a recognition of the futility and also just the fatigue of war. At the end of the 30 years of uh, fighting each other, they said, let's now agree that this is your territory, this is my territory. Wherever French is spoken is France, wherever German is spoken is Germany. And we agree to respect our boundaries. That is how this whole idea of a nation state was formed. On the basis of language and ethnicity, we were able to identify who is that community. And on the basis of uh, territoriality and control over certain institutions and monopoly of violence, the idea of a state and nation came together and that became nation state. Okay? And that is the world that we have today. When we talk about civilization, Bharatiya Jnana Parampara, we have to imagine how this registers in the minds of people who are not looking at this the way we are. For us, civilization is clear as a stream. It's like a river flowing. But for a lot of people, there are bridges. There are dams that they've constructed. And those dams are the boundaries. The dams is the idea of nation state. And therefore, when you talk about Dharma, and when you talk about uh, Dharmic civilization going from Kandahar all the way to uh, uh, Southeast Asia and you know in the West, potentially all the way up to Iraq, people who look at the world from this drishti, they, they do not reconcile well with this. And we are engaged in a dialogue with them. right? And therefore, we need to empathize about how they look at the world. We don't need to agree, but we need to certainly understand how they look at it. Okay? If that is nation state, what is the government? Uh, uh, Burke is a very influential political philosopher from the West. He says that it's a institution that we create to satisfy our own wants. Right? So what are the forces and situations that create and sustain nation state? So kinship, communities initially formed by bloodline, and over a period of time formed by economic and cultural and social associations. Religion is always the most important factor. Religion is what organizes a large number of people together. Industry, particularly in the post-industrial revolution world, and war. These are the four forces that have uh, shaped the world. Now, having examined this, I want to now quickly get into the idea of Indian Drishti. The reason I took the time to explain the Western Drishti first is to firstly understand where we are before we say Rashtra or uh, Indian imagination of state is this, this is what Artha Shastra says, this is what uh, uh, Shanti Parva says. We need to first understand what does the world say today and how is it different? So the state and Rashtra or nation state and Rashtra, are they one and the same? The answer is no. And here is why it is no. Okay? Our idea of Rashtra comes from a fundamentally different experience. I want us to go back to the first slide that I had, that there are stories about the world, story of science as the prime mover, story of uh, finance and technology as the prime mover, story of contest for power as the story of civilization. There are all these stories, right? But in our context, our imagination of state comes from this spiritual vision, which is also located in a geography and which creates a common culture, which is the idea of enlightenment or enlightening spiritual geocultural unit. So Rashtra for us in our vision is not just where a language ends and another language begins. It is not just where a skin color ends and another skin color begins. It is not just a land where one kind of dress, uh, you know, dress uh, sort of ends and something else begins. It is the vision of a spiritual geocultural unit and this is going all the way back to Rig Veda and from Rig Veda all, the, all through the literature that Rashtra itself in our imagination, this whole thing was created through Tapasya. It was created because there was intense sadhana done by enlightened beings 
who then created uh, a, a satisfaction in gods who bestowed upon us this idea that you can go and have a civilization now this is a spiritual idea if you come to examine this scientifically it is a uh, it is a completely wrong way to look at this because science cannot capture emotion science cannot capture your psychological comfort science cannot capture spiritual vision science is an explanation of second order consequences a spiritual vision always precedes science so when we say that there was tapas here we are saying that there was consciousness generated or there was preparation done for us to be able to tap into the consciousness right rashtra and atharva veda sainacharya uh, is this right uh, and this is also uh, where uh, you start seeing the idea of uh, desha right? as a kingdom uh, it acquired certain meanings right? like minister king friends idea of treasury fort and military this is the satkama theory in kautilya satya shastra as well right aitreya brahman and chatapata brahman the, the uh, shastras also uh, give us certain ideas that ultimately it is the upholder of kingdom and protector of kingdom and by protector of kingdom what do we mean we are saying the upholders of rata or the doers of dharma which then upholds rata that is the idea of rashtra for us it's a very very different so you do not see the idea of social contract alone there is of course an understanding of that because we also understand that humans can have downsides but we humans can also have an unfulfilled or unlimited uh, upside potential our imagination of state does not come from just managing our weaknesses we understand that there is a lot of thought in indian culture that is actually about making sure that we don't fall behind or below a certain baseline we are capable of that mahabharata is entirely about this right but mahabharata is also about bhagavad gita mahabharata is also about the acts that transform our base condition into something that is a spiritual vision and that potential is left open that is why you do not think about this only as rights or only as a contest for power you also think about this fundamentally as dharma dharma as doing your duty in a way that sustains everything else that is why the idea of nitya karma that is why the idea of tapasya because we understand that it is this inter dependent fractal kind of entity where my actions are positive and therefore contribute to your actions which then contribute to somebody else's actions this kind of positive feedback loop system based on the idea of a universe which is itself organized on that principle when we look at the planetary uh, constellation or planetary arrangement earth is held because it is exactly at the kind of distance it has to be for sunlight to be nourishing and not killing earth is there because sun rises without fall every day that is dharma when we when we look at uh, ritha when we look at uh, dharma it comes from the idea that there is in the cosmos there is in the universe a certain pattern a certain rhythm to things and things are held in their place because there are certain duties or certain patterns being followed that is what we try to mimic in our own social design we don't come from a political philosophy and social philosophy and then try to mimic cosmos that is a challenge that the western civilization has today that you have a fundamentally political idea of yourself or fundamentally social idea of yourself and then you try and understand how to sustain but if you look at the indian idea of rashtra it comes from this idea that there is a ratha there is dharma to maintain that ratha and therefore upholders of that are raja raja is somebody who pleases his or her people rajan right anji uh, in in telugu uh, my mother tongue it's it's the ability to please right in yajurveda Uh, it comes to us, uh, uh, you know, in the form of certain deities, right? uh, gods, Mitra, Varuna, Brihaspati, Indra, Agni. So broadly, we see the change in metaphysics around the thinking of nation and state. And you look at uh, the, this idea of Rashtra as a fully developed concept of a geo-cultural spiritual entity. There are challenges, like I said today, when you talk about dharmic civilization today. you are talking to a world that is organized as nation state so therefore you know there is obviously natural resistance if you say that dharma as a culture spread all over the world right because they are thinking in terms of political categories
So we will have to articulate this vision in a manner that is understandable. What are, you know, uh, Pawan Verma in a new book that has come up with uh, Hindu uh, civilization, the great Hindu civilization, he talks about, uh, 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 you know, that this civilization was fundamentally different uh, because it was shaped by the power of thought or the audacity of thought, right? The audacity of ideas itself. First idea is sacred cosmology, like I said. That sacred cosmology, that there is so much of diversity in this universe, created a fundamental orientation because we are observing nature, a fundamental orientation and comfort with diversity. That is the biggest challenge today. In a world where we've given everyone the power of opinion, we are not able to countenance somebody who has a different opinion. Therefore, you need to do diversity and inclusion training in academia, in uh, universities, and you know, in, uh, definitely in corporates where I come from. How ridiculous it is that you need to do a diversity training in corporate. It has to be your fundamental orientation as part of your culture. Right? And the idea that came was that nature needs huge amount of variety as material for it to evolve and for huge amount of material to be maintained you need cultural diversity so different people respecting different things creates the base material for the nature to examine so let's say there is that is how you have the idea of sacred groves sacred trees you sacralize something and your culture protects that and when it protects that, it creates the, or it does not disturb the loop that nature has to sustain itself because nature can then combine creatively and create new forms, all the variety that we see in the world. We are comfortable with this fundamentally. We don't need to be taught sustainability because this is the culture, right? And the other major uh, uh, idea is the idea of Saguna Nirguna synthesis. We do not understand this, but this is a crowning glory of our civilization. Just if we have to look at the amount of violence that has happened in the world simply because some civilizations and some religions and some cultures were not able to come to terms with the idea of form and formlessness, the idea of Vigraha versus the idea of the invisible God or spirit. Entire civilizations have been wiped off, entire pagan cultures have been destroyed. But this this audacity of ideas that we had, this richness of thought to synthesize, oh, you, you look at this, it is because your fundamental uh, swabhava is to go in, in the idea of bhakti and you need a form. Oh, you are contemplative. Your swabhava is to think in abstract. You go on this marble. So this is the Saguna Nirguna synthesis that has happened. That is the greatest treasure or the greatest gift, in my opinion, that we've shown the world of how to reconcile at the highest level this kind of diversity on something that is deeply personal as religion. And this, again, creating the idea of Vishnu Devas, the idea of energy, the kind of idea of Paddhati, Puja Paddhati, Vidis, all kinds of flowering. This is what Sri Aurobindo calls the multidimensional vital spirit of creativity in this land. And all of this translating into very, very simple and very effective sutras for us that you have certain duties to perform on a daily basis. You have your Nitya Karmas, you have the idea of Rana. Just to take the idea of Atiti, uh, and if you go into the etymology of Atiti, Atiti, we understand that it comes from the idea of time, that there is an organization. Atiti Devo Baba, where does that come from and where does uh, the Entire land understands this idea. Somebody who comes unannounced or you atiti, right? Treating that disturbance to your routine, what is otherwise considered disturbance to your routine, as God, Devo Baba, that is culture. That is the audacity of thought. That you offer and you grow by giving, not just by account of your right. You grow by giving. That is the idea that India has given the world in a political realm, in the idea of Rashtra. Uh, Sarvepalli Radhakrishnan puts it very well when he looks at the French Revolution ideals, liberty, equality and fraternity, and he puts an Indian spin on that and he says, liberty is possible only in the spiritual realm. It's only in that realm we can all say we are equal. Otherwise, world is diverse, complex. Equality in the context of politics is possible, that all of us can have one person, one vote is possible. 
But if you try and create equality of economics, if you try and create equality of uh, spirituality and spiritual experiences, if you try and create equality of lifestyle, which is what some some philosophies try to do, some political ideologies try to do with extremely devastating consequences. And fraternity is in the idea of all of us are, uh, there is a shared brotherhood. And if I have something, um, some kind of material prosperity, it is in the spirit of fraternity that I should share. That is the idea of dana, not as something that I'm tolerating and giving. Dana in the Hindu culture, in the Indian culture, all of uh, you know, our uh, dharmic faiths is not from a position of tolerating or uh, you know, doing something as charity. Dana is service. Right? So summing up, what is our idea of political philosophy or what is the idea uh, of Rashtra, which is different from the idea of state, which has certain paradigms. I, I go back to Kapil Kapoorji's words, uh, uh, you know, it's been an inspiration and a, a force uh, behind everything that we're doing today as part of this FDP. And he has a quote, he says, India has a one word unwritten constitution for over 5,000 years, and that is Dharma. So if the world is telling you that they have given us democracy, they have given us uh, political structures, we were not a nation before, we were not a state before, uh, we have to look back at them in the eye and tell them that uh, that is rubbish. Uh, because you probably need a written word uh, because you've codified ideas. We are comfortable with context and diversity as part of our civilizational wisdom. That is because we understand the idea of Dharma. So I stop there. Uh, thank you for uh, listening to my lecture. I open it up for questions. Doctor. Sumit Prashant, I see your hands raised. You could just give me one second. I'm going to put uh, lights on here. It's gone dark. Just give me one second. Yes. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, I want to ask about uh, what you said on the state. Yeah. Uh, one thing is, uh, first question I want to ask is about. Uh, Plato's ideas of ideal state hmm. and how it differs from a Stotlian idea. Yeah. Of, well, uh, they are slightly different. Were, even when they were related with a, a student pupil relationship. So, uh, why, why there's a difference between the two? And I uh, if, we can, if I can ask another question. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Uh, another thing I wanted to know about Rousseau, you spoke about Rousseau, a hmm. state of nature. Uh, and uh, I believe that Rousseau believed that state of nature was uh, a combination of good and bad. Uh, and which is why he, it is said that uh, uh, Rousseau's general will is Hobbes Leviathan with its head chopped off. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think that's a, that's absolutely correct. And, and that is what I meant by, uh, you know, fall from grace from the idyllic happiness. Uh, you know, we concur on that. Uh, and, and, and therefore, yes, uh, uh, it, it, we should see that as a continuum. Right? And, and of course, uh, different thinkers have contributed to that. But, but back to Plato and Aristotle, uh, uh, the question of, although they were, uh, they had that relationship, why are they different? I think that's a testimony to the liberty of thought that they had and something to be respected in the uh, Greek civilization. The other great civilization, you know, in, in context of ideas and uh, you know, the thought on, on nature and uh, nature of things. Uh, so that's, that's a testimony to uh, uh, that culture. But it's also, uh, I think, uh, a representation that uh, you know, one of them was, uh, was more animated uh, by an impulse to order things, right, uh, in, in, in the image of his idea of the world. The other person sort of probably looked at the world the way it is. And he said, what we need to do is incrementally advance it. We don't need to radically alter it. Right? And I think, uh, you know, uh, I would say we are probably close to that view, closer to that view, that there is a natural order to things. Human beings are also capable of uh, not just reason, but dharma, right? but, but the idea of spiritual enlightenment. So therefore, you don't give yourself this role, even as a state, that you need to impose. You are, and, and this is interesting, in, if you look at uh, certain historical literature, you see that there is a four-layered uh, kind of uh, decision-making in the Indian society. 
the king did not derive uh, legitimacy just by virtue of being a king. The king derived legitimacy by upholding dharma. That was Rajadharma as a custodian of dharma. But if you have a local conflict, uh, or, or let's say there is a dispute in a society, you do not go to the king directly. The first level of justice system was your local culture. What does your local custom and tradition tell you about this? Because you have a lived experience. Your own forefathers would have gone through something similar. We are not, not dropping off uh, in, a, in a vacuum. If you do not have that resolution within that, then you look at uh, council around you in your own Janapadas, in your own villages. Are there people, some wise council, some panchayat, somebody who has that? Right? If you do not have that, then you look at scriptural authority. Is there some Shastrakar? Shastras have to be understood also as compendium of best practices, not just dictums. Right? They're not designed that way. Then the person will say, okay, in this Shastra, this best practice where people who looked at the Desha, they have looked at this and they said, this is the best practice. You do this prior chitta, for example. Right? If that did not happen, then you go to king and the king becomes the arbiter. So this is, uh, I would say from a Bhartiya Drishti, uh, we understand that there are layers of context. And that is why we are highly comfortable with context. We do not look at things, we do not like things being presented as binary, just instinctively. And in that context, I think we are more closer to Aristotle than we are to it. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. Anyone else? I see some uh, things on the chat. I'm not sure if there were questions. Dr. Sumit has asked his question, which was there on the chat. Okay, Dr. Sagar. Yes, I see your hand raised. Please. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your uh, excellent uh, session for uh, Rasta and uh, its formation. Sir, I have one question. What is the importance of Dwaja in a development of a Rastra? Is it really uh, play any role for the uh, development or any kind of significance of that Dwaja in a Rastra? I am uh, not an authority. I've obviously read about this and I've understood this. Uh, it, is, it is a very, very critical component right, uh, of our civilization. And it goes back in a way to the idea of Aparushaya. Right? The, uh, the power of authorlessness. Institutions have to be on the strength of principles, not on the strength of personalities. That is a core idea that we get. Even as we respect Guru Parampara, even as the entire tradition is about Guru, but the Guru themselves also carry the Dwaja. Right? as a representation of a parampara. That what is important is the parampara and that is the enduring image. And so therefore the dvaja becomes a sacred symbol for an enduring tradition of knowledge seeking. It is not personified. Right? But at the same time, uh, uh, you know, it's also important to recognize that uh, that is one idea, very, very powerful idea, which is able to tell us that there is resistance particularly in moments of attack when you are under duress, when, you know, when some of the institutions are destroyed, when your access to your own knowledge is destroyed, then you, you know, this becomes a symbol of resistance. Right? And then there is very, very powerful imagery, even you know, going back, let's say 10, 15 years with uh, Kanchi uh, Periyava, when he went into uh, his diksha at, at the ripe age of maybe, he was maybe above 80 at that time, he carried his dvaja and he carried his uh, uh, Kamandala and he carried and he went all around because the idea of a, a Dharma Pravachan was that that you connect the society to this civilization to the idea of Sanatana once again and you need certain imagery. So when you become a, a, a disseminator of that kind of knowledge, you go with that Dvajai. It is your, uh, your, it is your imagery to say that I'm here to proclaim Dharma. So these are things that uh, I've gathered. It's not uh, a scholarly account. I would uh, I would be the first person to admit it. But this is how I have understood it through conversations. Any other questions, Dr. Rajesh Pradhanji? Yes, please ask. Maybe we could just yeah. What other questions? Uh, 
नमस्ते राघव जी वेरी नाइस सेशन कैन कैन यू कैन वी टेक दृष्टि स्थिति लय पॉइंट ऑफ व्यू इन रिगार्ड टू दियरीज और इन द प्रैक्टिकल एक्सपीरियंसेस दैट वी आर गोइंग थ्रू राइट नाउ फॉर द स्टेट द आइडियलिस्ट थियोरी द मार्क्सिस्ट थियोरी एंड द लिबरल थियोरी आई मीन इज द लिबरल थियोरी the end of uh, the concept mm-hmm. of uh, the state lawyer <laughs> are we moving towards a lawyer <laughs> that... yeah. no but thank you for that question uh, pradhan ji uh, it is not uh, and and it is not me saying it the same person who said it is the end of history has now recognized and there is a very very poignant uh, passage from uh, francis fukuyama who gave that idea of end of history <clears throat> when the berlin wall fell and you know that was seen as the death of communism he wrote in a book after that uh, uh, i forget the exact words but that translates something to the extra or to the essence of we now need a theory of soul we don't need history as a theory of human affairs we need a theory of soul to actually save our civilizations so that is a profound profound remark from a political philosopher who looked at the entire trajectory of events in the western world and who proclaimed the fall of berlin as the end of history uh, which is really the domination or you know for all times to come the proclamation of liberal democratic theory he said we it's not enough political philosophy is not enough we need a new metaphysics and therefore we need a new metaphysics for governance and that comes from the idea of soul that comes from the idea of yoga that comes from the idea of sanatan dharma uh, my my humble and but yet firm conviction is we are going to see the turn right and it is upon us to articulate and build on these theories because these theories have a fundamental purpose for the world we disparage you no know, there are unfortunately two dynamics at play uh, one dynamic uh, extols a vague idea of vishwaguru and and thinks of that as it is naive it is it is very uh, honest and admirable but it is naive right and and naivety unfortunately in today's world does not Uh, does not get us far because on the other side the reaction is that you no know, you you are not there is a big difference between what you are saying and what your country is today they examine us that that way right so when we talk about this we first have as academicians particularly there is a huge responsibility on academic leadership to build these theories taking into account the way the world is today right and that is i think uh, going to be the harbinger for uh, it we can call it anything right that, that can be a liberalism 2.0 or 3.0 or whatever uh, but it has to be grounded in the right understanding of human nature thank you very much i think that is so profound the theory of the soul he was already imagining the world based on those theories <laughs> <laughs> okay we yes we hands raised we conclude the session one uh, i think uh, there's a dm one second uh, okay dr asima tripathi ji uh, uh, thank you uh, for your uh, compliment uh, 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 the question is can dharma be implanted into our constitution again it's the question that i uh, and a lot of my colleagues tussle with every day uh, you you also heard uh, jay sai deepak ji uh, take a session and uh, he has written a book bharat uh, that is india uh, civilization coloniality and constitution it right? called so we that is the effort uh, we believe that it is not just possible but it is inevitable that is also the vision and the mandate that our gurus have given us uh, swami vivekananda sri arbindo everyone has given us that vision uh, swami vivekananda said he is able to see clearly as life that the ancient mother is rising once again sitting on her throne and he is asking us to go out and proclaim uh, and the instrument for that will also be constitution there is tremendous work to be done towards that but that work has begun a uh, lot more of us are conscious of this there is a civilizational consciousness that is coming out rashtram itself we see ourselves as a vehicle a small medium to generate that and and uh, embody that Uh, so my answer uh, uh, is an optimistic uh, affirmative yes uh, but the method uh, it does not come from a lack of recognition of the hard path ahead 
uh, it comes with the full recognition of knowing all the uh, arduous work ahead of us, uh, but it also uh, rests on the conviction given to us by our gurus. Wonderful. So with this, we conclude the session, a very, very powerful and touching session, no? Yes, all of us feel that. Yes, I see so many thumbs up. Amazing, really. Uh, may I invite Namrita to conclude this session with a prayer? And thank you, Raghuji. Thank you for your wonderful insights. Thank you. Oh Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Pyor Namaha Hari Om